Uh, hi, good evening, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, uh, depending on when you're listening to this. This is uh, Dr. Peter Gratton. Uh, we're going to go through Chapter uh, 13, Hypothetical and Scientific Reasoning. Um, this is uh, the PDF version that I currently have, um, um, but this will work for uh, future editions as well. And uh, what we're going to do is go through the hypothetical method, hypothetical reasoning, um, and then proof of hypotheses, and then how do we tentatively accept these hypotheses. But what I want to show you is that the hypothetical method is something we use every day. We do this kind of detective work all the time. So there is an occurrence of what they'll call, what they'll call uh, is called here a problem. We formulate a hypothesis, and think of problem here like a question on an exam, right? We call that a problem. How many problems are going to be on the test? We draw our implications from the hypothesis, and then we test the implications. So for example, uh, if you arrive uh, uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, a date or something like that, um, and the person isn't there, uh, there are several reasons that are possible, of course. Um, and you're going to form a hypothesis, right, about that, right? Um, so there's a problem. I'm sitting there, <laughs> I don't know why I came up with this one, but I'm sitting there at a restaurant, uh, um, I'm alone, uh, I made a reservation for two, um, and I was expecting uh, my date to show up. Uh, the waitress has now come over three times to ask me if I would like anything to eat, but I'm waiting uh, for that other person to come, and I'm looking and seeing it's now been 15 minutes uh, since... Uh, the time of the reservation. So we formulate a hypothesis, like a detective, right? And there are numerous hypotheses, and you'll see this in the um, the questions that are asked, especially in part one uh, of, of um, the homework, where they'll give you everyday examples where what we tend to do is formulate a hypothesis. And there are multiple hypotheses that are available, right? And I'll go through a couple of those. Um, and so we can formulate a hypothesis. The first hypothesis is, uh, it could be like somebody uh, perhaps, um, uh, well, th didn't appreciate you and like you as much as you thought um, and was not kind enough to uh, call. It could also be that um, this person's cell phone has been broken um, and as they tried to get to uh, the date, uh, they haven't yet ap appeared. Uh, simply because they've been caught in traffic or something like that. And so then you draw implications from this hypothesis, right? So from the first one, the person just wasn't interested in you, you're likely not to hear from them again, I would presume, right? Uh, what kind of jerk would not show up for a date, not be interested, and then try to uh, uh, call you later on. So that's one implication from that hypothesis, right? You don't expect to see the person come in suddenly or whatever. And then you test the implication. Right? So one implication for that might simply be, I don't know, uh, you won't hear from that person again. And when you don't hear from that person again, then you know that your hypothesis was likely correct. But if the person is caught in traffic, you're waiting for, for a date, there's uh, been an unforeseeable car accident, although, you know, good advice for any date is make sure you're very early and just be at the cafe, you know, a few blocks down just to make sure you're not late. Um, and so your hypothesis that the person might be stuck in traffic and just not able to call because you shouldn't make phone calls uh, while driving, of course. The implications from that hypothesis would be what? If I just wait a few more minutes, I might see them. And even if I leave, say it's 6.30, because the waitress has now come around six times uh, at that point, they might still arrive. And so how do we test the implication? Well, the only test for that implication would be you probably don't want to call them yourselves and seem a little bit desperate. But on the other hand, uh, we know that uh, if the person does call, that would seem to uh, confirm that hypothesis, right? Especially if they say, I was stuck in traffic and so on. Now, if this continues to happen, then you might have concerns about what, how interested the person is if they can't manage to come to dates on time or whatever. But you get the idea that in our everyday experience, if there's an occurrence and a problem, we formulate the hypothesis, we draw implications from the hypothesis, and then we test the implications, right? So these four stages are extremely important, right? And we see that this, again, hypothetical reasoning is inductive forms of reasoning. And in the book, the four examples are given are the discoverer of radium by Pierre and Marie Curie. 
uh, really this discovery was more on Marie's side, uh, uh, the discovery of the planet Neptune uh, by Adams uh, Leverrier and, and uh, Gall, uh, and the discovery of atmospheric pressure by Torricelli, and Pasteur's research concerning the spontaneous generation of life. So these are the four examples they give you that use the hypothetical inquiry. And I'm not going to go into those because I think they're straightforward. Although on the test, you should look for questions to concern precisely these examples because I think they're helpful and useful examples for thinking about uh, scientific reasoning. But also how scientific reasoning is something not foreign to what we do in everyday life. That it is not something high-flung that is just done in laboratories or by uh, a Copernicus studying the, uh, the orbits of the planets, uh, but is in fact done by each of us every day. Um, each of us are little scientists or little detectives trying to figure out uh, why things are happening. Right? And so we have two different types of hypotheses. There are empirical hypotheses where you can point to things in the world, that is, uh, for the Neptune example, we can point to Neptune out in the sky and see how that was affecting the gravitational pull of other planets. And then uh, theoretical hypotheses are not all that different. Uh, in fact, actually, it's often hard to do it, but, are, but they're not easily as easily observed. We just see the results um, and presume that uh, that is correct. So it is theoretical in that uh, sense. So with empirical hypotheses, they are proved with theoretical hypotheses, we confirm them to varying degrees. We get more and more evidence. So a theoretical hypothesis might be Einstein's theory of relativity. You can't just point to it like you would point to the planet Neptune. Uh, it is a theory about how the universe works, at least physically. Um, there are alternative theories, of course, in quantum mechanics at the micro level, uh, that is at the atomic level, but at the uh, macro level, that is how um, uh, uh, the ray of uh, the, uh, how light is affected by gravity and so on. Um, um, that is a theoretical hypothesis that is continually confirmed again and again uh, as we learn more and more about uh, the universe, right? So it's a hypothetical process of a um, hypothesis that is confirmed, but we can't just point to, oh, the theory of relativity right out there. We can point to the planet Neptune. So we, you get that, I hope, that distinction. That's the only really major distinction made here. Uh, we got a little bit on, on Peirce, who's an important philosopher. And then we talk about the tentative acceptance of hypotheses, right? Why do we accept them? Well, first they have to be adequate. Does the hypothesis fit the facts, right? So for example, uh, is my hypothesis that uh, my date uh, is perhaps stuck in traffic? I'll be hopeful. Um, uh, adequate to the facts. Yes, it would fit those facts, right? Um, just to use that example, the person late to the restaurant, right? Is it internally coherent, right? That is, are they interconnected? Uh, now, obviously, the example of somebody being late in traffic is not uh, something uh, where we worry too much about internal coherency rather than um, a whole set of data. But, um, you know, there is, so, there is a set of data. You are there at the restaurant on time. The other person is not there on time. That's two data points at least. Uh, perhaps the third data point is that you heard on, uh, on the radio uh, on the way uh, to uh, the restaurant that there was an overturned tractor trailer on one of the major highways uh, in the city um, or in your area. And therefore, those data points are connected by that hypothesis. Oh, he might be running late because of that traffic jam I heard, right? Just keeping this simple. Now again, they're, they're talking about the examples there, but I want you to see that uh, that, inc that coherency uh, is important. Now external consistency occurs when a hypothesis does not agree with other confirmed hypotheses, right? So in other words, if we take up this hypothesis, does it get rid of other hypotheses? Yes. If I accept that the person is late, I can't accept that they're not just showing up because they don't like me or something else. Okay. And so often we look for external consistency where our, um, the, our hypothesis fits with other things we know about the world. Right. So, for example, if we accept Einstein's theory of relativity, 
That doesn't mean we reject everything that New Newtonian physics, which came before Einstein, was largely accepted. Uh, it doesn't change any our major beliefs about Newtonian physics. We're still taught it uh, at the college level and the high school level for some of us, right? It's not inconsistent, but it shows uh, the limits of Newtonian uh, Newtonian uh, physics. Fruitfulness is the extent to which a hypothesis suggests new ideas for future analysis and confirmation. Now, this fruitfulness might be, the, for example, uh, the ways in which, hey, perhaps there was a friend uh, who told you this person liked you um, and you suggested a date with them. Uh, perhaps you might want to analyze how good that friendship is or something like that. Uh, that's a bit of a joke, but you could see how that would work with the scientific theories, right? And so then in these exercises, um, they give you, I think, to just to show you how this works in everyday life, uh, for example, uh, to form a hypothesis, and then what kind of experiment or inquiry would we use to confirm our hypothesis, right? So someone you have been dating has a birthday coming up, you call a florist, you order flowers for the occasion, two days later the person is cold and distant, right? So we can imagine a number of hypotheses and how we would test that hypothesis. One, right, um, you think they had a birthday coming up, they didn't, and they're angry with you, uh, or cold to you, at least, uh, for not having it correct. Uh, the second is, of course, the flowers didn't arrive, right? Third hypothesis is possible. Um, say uh, the per you ordered flowers, and the person you're dating has to told you again and again um, is not uh, the kind of flowers you like, that they like, right? So they might, like, might not like roses, and you ordered roses. Or you might have ordered roses that turned out to be... Um, uh, not very good. And so how do you confirm this? You ask the other person. You say, I'm sorry, I sent you flowers. What was the problem? They'll be a little bit more cold, um, but they'll be able to confirm or disconfirm uh, your hypothesis about whether it was the fact that it was roses that was the problem, whether it was the fact that it, they didn't get delivered, or whether it was simply the fact uh, that uh, you got their, their uh, birth date wrong, right? And you could see how you would use that for each of these, right? And then, uh, of course, they have a number of other um, um, uh, ways of uh, uh, other uh, uh, ways of looking at the chapter. Um, but what I want you to see is how every day we use this kind of hypothetical inductive reasoning, right? Um, and then uh, move forward. Okay. So now let's go into um, uh, into our slides, and we look at hypothetical reasoning. Um, and what I'd like you to do too is, is also to use that to think more about how is hypothetical reasoning different from superstitious reasoning, okay? Um, how is that different? So let's go, um, hopefully this will be relatively quick. Uh, so obviously we're exploring the role of hypotheses in inductive reasoning and provides uh, we're providing criteria for its use. So let's be clear though because this often comes up in our politics and it often comes up uh, by people who know little about science and so on. When somebody says that um, Einstein's uh, explanation of relativity is, is a hypothesis or is merely theoretical, right, that does not mean that it is wrong or that you shouldn't accept it. In fact, the best science we have, the best data that we have, confirm again and again Einstein's theory of relativity. And we could also talk about other so-called theory. The theory of evolution is one we still battle over. Um, but a number of the fossil record has again and again, at least according to scientists, confirmed our hypothesis about evolution, right? Even if scientists argue over exactly how evolution might work, right? Whether it works at the species level or works at the individual level or even at simply the genetic level. Right? So just because it is a hypothesis doesn't mean it's not a hypothesis that has been uh, not been confirmed again and again. And we see this coming up again uh, all, all, all the time. So for example, the hypothesis that climate change uh, has been occurring for some, um, for some time, that the Earth is warming, is something that the data has been telling us uh, for uh, at least a decade or two. A decade or two. Uh, the scientists have formed, many, most scientists have formed a hypothesis that the, um, the increased uh, 
the increase, um, um, increased amount in the atmosphere of carbon and methane in particular uh, have led to this global uh, climate change. Uh, and therefore, um, and the only place that could have come from is, is, is uh, human beings. Uh, they are the ones who are expelling. Uh, we are the ones who are expelling this through uh, um, our cars, our industries, and so on. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's just a hypothesis. It is just a theory. But again, the data have uh, confirmed this uh, again and again. And so there's a lot of times in politics where we talk about something as a theory as if to devalue it when, in fact, all of science uh, as as or as, as a great majority of science occurs by the use of this hypothetical uh, inductive method. And much of our life does too. You couldn't exist without it. And there's hypotheses you have. Um, this uh, person who is dating me doesn't love me um, uh, and doesn't show up for dates on time, right? And you use further data points to confirm that rather actual hideous fact. Uh, but you wouldn't call it a theory after a while in the everyday sense. What we set mean by theory, what we mean by hypothesis has a very precise sense. So hypothetical reasoning is used to produce, obviously, explanations. But not every explanation depends on hypothetical reasoning. For example, suppose that you raise corn and as it rained in weeks, you might furnish this explanation. This cornfield is dying because it has rained in weeks and the soil is bone dry. This is based on direct observation, and it doesn't really involve, uh, and it involves no hypotheses. Except if I say that there is a hypothesis, I don't know, I'm not, I'm less sure that um, this explanation doesn't involve a hypothesis. Why? The hypothesis is this direct relation, of course, between um, the needs of, of corn and so on to have rain in order to uh, be fruitful. Uh, I guess vegetable. <laughs> uh, since it's corn. But suppose that um, you saw your baby brother, who is named Bill, uh, track mud into the house. You might furnish this explanation to a parent. There's mud on the floor because Bill tracked it in from the outside. Okay, now that is obviously a hypothesis. Where did the mud come from? So see the detective work here. Okay. Um, but they're saying it's just based on direct observation. You saw the mud coming from the outside. You're not really forming, there's not really de any detective work here, right? Um, you're just seeing the observation. You see the dry cornfields. You see the mud on the floor being directly tracked from the outside. You're not really being a detective uh, at this point. But our hypotheses are required for explanations when direct observation is not sufficient to supply the needed reason. So. I see the empty chair across from me in that restaurant um, where I was expecting to have a date, right? And there are lots of reasons for that, right? But the data only tells me it's empty. And then I have to sort of work backwards to try to think of a reason that produces that data, right? So now you're becoming the detective. So f suppose, for example, you subscribe to a daily newspaper that is delivered every morning to your doorstep, but when you open the door on this particular morning, there is no paper. Now maybe it's in the bushes, so you look in the bushes. Still no paper. First hypothesis. Maybe it's on the, right? And notice the data don't support the hypothesis, right? So you move to a second one. Well, maybe it's on the roof, so you look on the roof. Still no paper. Second hypothesis. And maybe the paper boy didn't deliver it. So you get on the phone and you call him up. This is how you attempt to confirm, see each time, you're looking to confirm or disconfirm your hypothesis doing your detective work. But merely not seeing the newspaper is not, is not a hypothesis itself. What is the hypothesis is why. Why is this happening, right? So we get these three uh, conjectures or hypotheses uh, and they lead to implications. If I look in the bushes, I may find the paper. If I look on the roof, I may find the paper. If I uh, phone the paper boy, he may tell me if he delivered it. And these implications lead to tests. You look in the bushes, you look on the roof, you phone the paper boy. Right? I think this is relatively straightforward. In summary, the hypothetical method involves, as we said um, before, uh, but as just as a way of introducing the chapter, there's the occurrence of a mystery or a puzzle. 
Secondly, that we formulate a hypothesis. Thirdly, we draw implications from the hypothesis, right? Um, um, the uh, the uh, the papers in the bushes on the, in the woods, or perhaps wasn't delivered at all, and then we test the implications of that hypothesis. We look, we look on the roof, we look in the bushes, we make a phone call. Okay, this vase or vase, if you wish, that sits on a narrow shelf in the corner of the room. When you come home one evening to a locked and closed house, the vase is lying broken on the floor. Okay. So let's identify the hypotheses that represent reasonable approaches to solving this mystery. Uh, and then when we're finished, we can click Submit. Well, if we had a cat, then it knocked it off the shelf, right? So this is reasonable. A pol poltergeist knocked it off the shelf. Now, I don't think this is reasonable, given that poltergeists, uh, as far as we know, do not exist. Uh, if we lived in uh, California or else where earthquakes are more common, we might have that one. Um, we wouldn't think, but let's just say for the sake of what is most likely, if we have a cat, yeah, that's probably it. Uh, but an earthquake happening, uh, well, you would have heard about an earthquake, so let's just say that's not very probable. The vase jumped off the shelf by itself. No, that's not possible. A momentary gravitational warp drew the vase off the shelf. Uh, no, we don't have uh, wormholes uh, and so on from science fiction actually existing. And a burglar knocked the vase off the shelf. Well, okay. If we had a cat, that's possible. Let's say this is possible. Let's say we, we you are uh, in California. It's, it's possible, not probable. The rest of these are not really possible. A burglar knocking the vase off the shelf... Well, we don't have to see any reason um, to believe that there's a break-in. All the windows are fine, and the door is locked. All right, so let's see what they say. We hit click submit. Uh, there's at least one more reasonable hypothesis. Um, I guess it could be a burglar who... Um, uh, a burglar who... Um, who came into the house but was very careful to make sure the doors were locked on the way out. So it's possible. Uh, assuming we have a cat, the cat could have knocked the vase off the shelf, and show, so could an earthquake and a burglar. These are the possible ones. The rest are, are based on what we would call superstition. So, the cat knocked it off the shelf. What implication probably follows from it? The cat is sleeping. The cat is still in the house. The cat has a broken foot. Well, we would say the cat is still in the house. Right? That's how it knocked it off. Given that the house was shut, we'd expect the cat to be inside. So we have two data points, vase on the floor, and the house is shut up. Okay? That is, all the windows are closed. Suppose now that you search through the house and find the cat, how does this discovery affect the hypothesis? Does it prove it's true? Does it prove it false? Or does it tend to confirm it? So it just tends to confirm it, right? In other words, it still could have been a burglar. It still could have been a minor earthquake. It just tends to confirm it. Oh, the cat's still in the house. Um, that's probably what happened, right? Um, but the vase still could have been broken by the other two means. Suppose, on the other hand, that you search through the house and you find no cat. How does it affect the hypothesis? Well, I would say that it tends to disconfirm it. Now, it could be that the cat somehow got out of the house. I think it, it, that should be... I, I, I think that proves it false. They're going to say probably tends to disconfirm it, but I say it proves it false. Why? The windows are shut. The doors are shut. Cats don't open and shut windows. Cats don't open and shut doors. Okay? Okay, so the consuming, assuming the cat had no other way out, the cat's absence would prove the hypothesis false. So it's not even tending to, to uh, disconfirm it. Disconfirming means uh, helping to prove it wrong. So, what implication follows from uh, the second possibility, that uh, an earthquake would happen? Well, what if we saw some um, walls are cracked, uh, some windows are broken, some pictures on the wall are hanging crooked, right? Uh, well, all three would, would are the results of, um, of, of an earthquake, right? Walls tend to crack, some windows tend to break, some pictures on the wall are hanging 
uh, crooked, right? So we say that, right? But this is the most common effects for even the most minor earthquakes is that windows would be uh, hanging crooked. So suppose we check the pictures and two are hanging crooked. How does this discovery affect the hypothesis? It tends to confirm it. I would actually even say it proves it true. I'll go stronger, right? It doesn't just tend to confirm it. If I came home, vase is on the floor and two pictures are hanging um, crooked, I guess it tends to confirm in the sense that a burglar could, could have gone past the, the pictures and knocked into them, right? So we could try that um, because the, um, it tends to confirm the hypothesis but doesn't prove absolutely that it's true, okay? But again, notice how we're just using our reasoning here to get through this to see, oh, is it really uh, proving it, proving it, or is it just tending to confirm what, what we think is the case? Suppose, on the other hand, that you check the pictures and not one is crooked. How does this discovery affect the hypothesis? It tends, I think, to disconfirm it. Now, it doesn't have to be the case that uh, an earthquake does do that uh, to pictures on the wall in every case. Um, but if it was strong enough to knock off a vase, you would think uh, the pictures would, would, of course, not be straight. But it doesn't have to happen, right? Um, I've lived through earthquakes, minor earthquakes. That doesn't have to happen. Right, so um, it helps to disconfirm that uh, that hypothesis that an earthquake did it, but again, it might have been one strong enough in that place in that location to knock over a vase, but not strong enough to uh, make the uh, uh, frames on the wall uh, uh, crooked. Right. So let's now see what implication follows from the burglar hypothesis. Um, one, uh, there are dirty dishes in the sink. Yeah, that would confirm that a burglar came in. But what is most likely? That something in the house is missing. Not that there's just TV is in, on. Now this is true, this would show somebody was in the house, but we're looking for a burglar, right? Somebody who takes something, right? So a burglar is somebody who comes into a, a place that's not their property and they take something, okay? They enter for that purpose. In general, people do not go in to uh, use your dishes or to simply watch TV. Okay. So suppose you now look through the house and find some pieces of jewelry missing. How does this discovery affect the hypothesis? It proves it's true. Okay. Uh, they're going to say it doesn't prove it's true. It tends to confirm it then. Um, I click OK. Right. It tends to confirm it. I would say it proves it's true. Though, of course, proof is, of course, um, very strong. And I think what they're saying is it tends to confirm it, but there could be other reasons the jewelry is missing, right? Uh, it provides uh, inductive support um, that a burglar did it, but it doesn't prove that a burglar had done it. We often misplace our things, right? So that's why they're saying it tends to confirm it. I, tend, I would tend to think as soon as I see jewelry, just because I tend not to misplace things, uh, that that would, that would prove it, at least for me. Um, but um, others might have a different idea. So that's about whether how strong you take that piece of evidence uh, for your hypothesis. Suppose, on the other hand, that you look through the house and find nothing missing. How does this affect the hypothesis? It tends to disconfirm it, right? The vase is knocked over. There's nothing missing. You have it. Disconfirm. So notice how um, strong, um, um, how much evidence you would need, really, to prove it false or prove it true. It's it's about confirming, tending to confirm or tending to disconfirm. So it's unlike, it's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily false. It's just more probable or less probable. That's what we're looking at here. Okay. So let's now look at a second practice problem of the same sort. Suppose you have an ordinary two-cell flashlight. When you tried it a week ago, it worked just fine, but when you switch it on now, it doesn't work. Okay, a two-cell, I assume, is a two-battery flashlight. Uh, let's just hope that's the case. Identify the hypothesis that represent a reasonable approaches to solving this mystery. When you're finished, click the Submit button. Obviously, the battery is dead. 
the air is too dry. No, my flashlights have worked in the desert. They've worked in uh, wet forests and so on. It's too early in the day. No, a flashlight works uh, early in the day, late in the day, and so on. But the bulb could be burned out or broken. These are the two first things that you would check, right? right? These are the usual things that you look for, right? So you're forming an hypothesis, right? So you're not just pointing out uh, some problem. You're forming a hypothesis about how you got the problem. So what implication follows from the battery hypothesis? If the batteries are put into another flashlight, the bulbs won't light, right? That is certainly true. Um, if the batteries are placed in uh, the sink, uh, water, they will sink. I don't know anything about batteries, and if they go out, anything about them not floating in the sink, but I think that's not right. If the batteries are touched, they will feel cold. Again, these are not things that happen generally with batteries. Um, you put it into another flashlight, and this is what we do all the time, right? If we have remote control for our TV, uh, and, the, and the remote control isn't working, we might try the, the, the batteries in a different remote control where we try them in some other thing to, uh, to other apparatus to see if it's working. Okay? Suppose we put the batteries into another flashlight and the bulb doesn't light. How does this discovery affect the hypothesis? It tends to confirm it. Right? It doesn't prove it is... Um, it doesn't, it doesn't prove it's because the bulb uh, in the other flashlight might be bad. So you're not proving absolutely that it's just the batteries. It could be the battery and the light bulb. For example, one could imagine uh, both ended up in water the night before or something like that, but it tends to confirm it. Okay. Suppose, on the other hand, that you put the batteries into another flashlight and the bulb lights up. How does this discovery affect our hypothesis that it's the batteries that are dead? It tends to disconfirm it. Right? Disconfirmed just meanings tends to disprove it. Okay. I'm sorry. Wait, maybe I've read this wrong. Let me go back. Click OK. The batteries are dead. So we, that you put the batteries into another flashlight and the bulb lights. Oh, this sorry. Um, uh, this proves it true. How could the bulbs light when the batteries are dead? I must be, sorry, I'm having a brain moment here. Uh, a brain, um, sorry, suppose on the other hand, so the, sorry, the hypothesis is the batteries are dead. Uh, you put the batteries into another flashlight and the bulbs light. Well, this tends to prove, oh, that the batteries are dead. It proves it uh, false, right? If the battery lights, the batteries cannot possibly be dead. So see how strong that has to be. My apologies. I should read these more closely. Um, as of going through them. Okay, but do you see that? Um, that's actually helpful, right? If the bulbs are lighting up, it has to be the case. So it's not even just tends to disconfirm it. It proves it false. So see, uh, at least uh, the distinction that they're trying to make here between tending to disconfirm something or disprove it and proving it false. So that's a lot of evidence. But obviously, if you put batteries in something else and, they, and it works, it proves that the batteries are not the problem. Okay. So, what implication follows from the from our bulb hypothesis, namely that the bulb uh, is out. If the bulb is placed in a microwave oven and the oven is turned on, the bulb will explode. Um, I'm not sure about the relationship between bulbs in microwave ovens and bulbs used in flashlights, um, but if the bulb explodes, that could be a lot because a lot more power than a uh, battery is put into it. That doesn't help us. That's not an implication. If the bulb is put onto another flashlight having good batteries, the bulb won't light. Right? That seems the most likely to me. If we breathe on the bulb, it will fog up. Again, I don't know anything about uh, flashlight, too much about flashlight bulbs, but uh, that doesn't seem to be one of them. Right? It's if we put it into another flashlight, and again, a similar model. Uh, at one point, it was more, uh, flashlights tended to be more or less uh, uniform. Uh, so that's a common test for flashlight bulbs would, would be to check them in another flashlight. Okay. Suppose that we put the bulb into another flashlight having good batteries and the bulb doesn't light. How does uh, this discovery affect the hypothesis? So suppose you put the bulb into another flashlight having good batteries and the bulb doesn't light. Well, it tends to prove it true, right? Um, or does it tend to confirm it? How strong do we think this is? Right? That the bulb is burned out or broken. Well, there's only really 
there's only there's there's other things that could happen in a flashlight, right? Um, so we put the bulb in another flashlight and it lights up, but maybe one of the wires is loose in the flashlight or something like that. That's why I don't think it proves it absolutely true. In the same way that if a bulb works, it would be true. I think it just tends to confirm it, right? The fact that the bulb doesn't light provides inductive support that the bulb is burned out or broken. But there could be other reasons why the bulb doesn't light. We have a broken switch, which is what I was saying. The wire, um, uh, the wire to the bulb uh, between the battery and the bulb, uh, put in place by the switch, is broken. Okay. So suppose, on the other hand, that you put the bulb into another battery and the bulb lights. How does this discovery affect the hypothesis that the bulb is burned out or broken? It proves it absolutely false. Right? It's that strong. It doesn't just tend to disconfirm it. The bulb is working. Therefore, saying it's not working is absolutely false. Right? So, two conclusions for, uh, follow from these practice problems. The first is that tests that have positive results can never prove a hypothesis true, but they do tend to confirm it. Right? The cat is in the house, pictures are crooked, jewelry is missing, batteries don't work in the second bulb, second flashlight, bulb doesn't work in the second flashlight, and so on. Right? Uh, they can only tend to confirm it. Uh, tests that have negative results can sometimes prove a hypothesis false, but they often merely tend to disconfirm it, right? But um, we can prove it false by batteries do work in a second flashlight. The bulb does work in a, se a second flashlight. But disconfirming, which is different, slightly less powerful. Um, cat is not in the house. Pictures are not crooked. Nothing is missing. Okay. So again, one is stronger than another. Okay. So now let's look at a problem more closely related to scientific reasoning. Suppose you're a biologist and you visit a small village in a foreign country. The villagers tell you that a certain kind of sparrow, which is found only in that region, began dying a couple of years ago. Shortly after that, the villagers began to get sick, and today some of them are dying of an unknown illness. Right? Immediately, you start to think that the sparrow carries an illness that the human beings are now getting. The disease starts out with flu symptoms, followed by debilitating weakness. After that, some people recover, but others do not. You examine some of the dead birds, and you find that they died of an unusual form of cancer. Then you examine the sick villagers, and you find that they have the same cancerous lesions as the dead birds. Obviously, we're going to try to see a relationship between the two. So we formulate a hypothesis that a virus is transmitting the cancer from the birds to the villagers. Right? This is what a biologer, biologist would normally do. Now, suppose that there are known cases of other viruses that have migrated from birds to people. Does this fact strengthen or weakness, weaken our hypothesis? Well, it strengthens it. Because if we have never heard of viruses moving from birds to people before, then that would tend to weaken our argument. But it strengthens it if we know that it has happened. Right? If birds have passed diseases on to us before, then, um, then that helps us uh, think that, yes, uh, diseases can come from birds uh, to us now. Okay? Suppose we know the mechanism by which the virus has caused disease in organism. Um, does this strengthen or weaken our hypothesis? Suppose that we know the mechanism by which viruses cause disease in organisms. Um, well, of course, this would strengthen, I guess, our hypothesis, right? Knowing how viruses work uh, will help us when we make a hypothesis about how, it, how these diseases work in organisms. They work in similar fashion uh, between two different types of um, uh, two different types of animals. And of course, we've seen this uh, with uh, uh, the avine flu, uh, avine flu uh, sorry, the bird flu uh, in Eastern Asia some, uh, a decade ago. Uh, we've seen this with uh, viruses that come from cow uh, meat and viruses that come from pigs and so on. So uh, we've seen this before. Now suppose that you conduct a survey of other villages and wherever you find that the disease you also find this species of sparrow. Well, this is going to strengthen our argument. I don't think this takes a lot of detective work to figure out, right? Um, in other words, we keep finding more cases 
where there's a link between where the sparrow is and where the disease is breaking out among human beings. On the other hand, suppose you find we find an isolated village where people are dying of the same cancer, but there are no sparrows of the species anywhere to be found. Well, this, of course, would weaken this hypothesis, right? Because there's no relationship between the sparrow and the disease. Okay, and so that's correct. And suppose that no other virus has been found that transmits cancer from one organism to another. Right? Would this make other scientists more interested in studying this virus? In other words, is it, um, um, is it the kind that can lead to more research? Right? Has been found that transmits cancer uh, from one organism to another. Well, I think scientists would be more interested, right? Because now they have at least one disease that would do it. Right? Studying the virus is likely to lead to important new discoveries about the nature of cancer. This means that the hypothesis is what we called fruitful. Right? The last part of, of every hypothesis is that hopefully it's fruitful leads to further investigations. The best hypotheses lead to further ideas, open up whole new avenues of discovery. Right? Just as uh, Newton's theories uh, of gravity uh, Newton's theory of gravity, just as uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, just as uh, numerous scientists' uh, discoveries regarding co uh, quantum mechanics, they have led to the modern world. That is, they've led to entire industries and entire uh, research foundations, entire uh, halves of our universities who are working on how to follow through on the scientific progress we have made from those theories. So it makes a lot of people much more interested. Okay, So again, the factors that determine the plausibility of a scientific hypothesis are coherence, adequacy, uh, external consistency, that is consistency, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, fruitfulness. Hypotheses that have all these features tend to be more plausible than those that lack them. Now, suppose that instead of being a biologist, you're a missionary representing a fundamentalist religious sect. I'm going to leave this one alone. I think this is clearly a case where um, those who uh, think that God is punishing the villagers for failing to live righteously, um, why would God choose to infect them with cancer? You're not formulating a hypothesis that is really testable, right? Um, whereas the sparrow one is testable. This is where... Um, perhaps superstition comes in. I don't like the word fundamentalist. That tends to be used for a number of uh, mainstream um, uh, American religions here. But um, uh, but uh, I think those kind of religions that do not accept at all uh, scientific practices. So I'm just going to leave this here uh, as a warning for trying to differentiate between scientific reasoning and uh, those that are done by um, superstition, if you will. Uh, and it's important to make that distinction uh, because without being able to make that distinction, there are all kind of hucksters and so on who, who try to uh, tell you not to believe in, 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 in scientific hypotheses um, and instead to buy the latest things that people are trying to sell, right? For example, for, um, uh, for healing you and so on. Uh, and so it's clear that we have to, um, once we take up the scientific method, then we can test things that are, say, what are called New Age medications, right? And they do studies on them all the time. Or on the use of things that we once thought were just superstitious, like the use of hypnosis and so on, right? Or the use of um, um, uh, other Eastern forms of medication, right, are ones that are being tested, and some are found viable, and, and others aren't, right, uh, for that. So that is not superstitious thinking. That just happens to be something you put up to scientific investigation um, and um, hypothetical reasoning. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Okay, um, but I uh, thank you for following that. Uh, if you have any questions, do let me know. Um, you can email me. Uh, you can, of course, also uh, see me during my office hours or do virtual office hours as well. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and again, let me know if you have any questions.